Hello and welcome to the Local Haunts booktube tag. Uh, if you're here, you've probably heard of Local Haunts. It's a horror anthology. I should probably get it out of my rucksack. Keep rolling. It's this bad boy. Uh, Local Haunts edited by Regina St. Clair. There are 19 terrifying tales from all of your, well, some of your, fa well, a couple of your favorite horror tube creators. I mean, I'm in there, uh, so that's good. And uh, today we're going to be doing a book tag inspired by this. So we have 10 questions. I'm out here in location in a very stunning, well, in the graveyard, very stunning West Wickham, uh, West Wickham Hill. I think that's where we're at. The Golden Ball is up there. Uh, we visited the Hellfire Caves. And uh, these are some of the key locations for my story in this, which is a stone's throw. But we're going to get to that later. As you know, with book tags, a bunch of questions. I'm going to tag some people at the end to take it. And uh, let's, get, let's get started with spooky question one. Local haunts. Tell us about a creepy or spooky place that's close to you. We're here by Lord Dashwood's grave. We think it might be Francis Dashwood. We actually have no idea, <laughs> literally no idea. But um, we're going to say it's Lord Francis Dashwood because he was the character uh, in one of in, in my story in a stone's throw. Um, so I'm going to tell you a few of the local haunts here in High Wycombe, and these are really the stories that shaped my my story in the anthology. So again, we're here. Uh, uh, well, the Golden Ball is in the background. That's part of the old churchy bit. Good old Francis Dashwood buried over there. Uh, he was a real person. Actually, a lot of the areas in Wickham are named after Dashwood. Uh, but he was also like the head honcho of the Hellfire Caves. Francis had this uh, like club dedicated to drunkenness and debauchery. Basically, they just got really drunk and had sex with a load of prostitutes. Is what they did, um, you know, not very different to these days. There's some horses. So um, right, where was I? Yeah. So uh, Francis, the the story goes that he had uh, he had a gay lover, and uh, unfortunately, this guy died and Francis was really upset about it and I believe it was his heart that he kept uh, and buried that in the Hellfire Caves I want to say. Very haunted area, lots of ghosts throughout the Hellfire Caves but the one that I wrote about is Suki who was the teenage barmaid of the Georgian Dragon and uh, yeah she uh, was hounded to death sort of accidentally a bit by some local boys and they, they say that her, her ghost still haunts the place to this day. It's very, very sad. What, what else can I add about Wickham? that's local and haunted. There's the Bandit Highway between Wickham and Beaconsfield. Okay, I don't know what that is. Nah. But there's a Bandit Highway between Wickham and Beaconsfield. <laughs> well, Wickham, Wickham's quite a historic town as well, so that's where like a lot of this history comes in. I mean, it was a staging post on the way into London, and actually that again plays into uh, plays a part in a stone's throw where one of the characters is stopping off in Wickham on his way into London, and uh, that's why a lot of the pubs and stuff grew out of it. Question two, a stone's throw. Tell us about a story with a young female character who's had a tough life. So we're here at the Hellfire Caves, which is where a good chunk of the action in my story, A Stone's Throw, takes place. I don't want to spoil it for you, but uh, little Suki from the Georgian Dragon comes along here. Uh, it's a pretty haunted place, lots of history to it. I might be doing a fuller video on that soon as well. And uh, yeah, I, I should answer the question, shouldn't I? So we're going for The Breathing Method by Stephen King. And I've, told, I've been told I can't talk about the backstreet abortion parts of that story. But that's okay, because she doesn't have a backstreet abortion. She just gets decapitated in a car accident and then delivers a, a baby while not having a head. But she has pretty tough life circumstances because um, she's, you know, she's pregnant and she wants to keep the kid, but she has no money. Um, she's even talking to a doctor about like how, what's the longest that I can work? What's the longest amount of time that I can, um, you know, disguise the fact that I'm pregnant? Um, because this was at a time when uh, unmarried pregnant women were kind of looked down upon in society and so she was worried about losing her job and a doctor was kind of ca cautioning her against like, she was, he was like, don't wear a girdle mate because if you wear a girdle, it'll mess up the baby. I think he used the word retarded because it was 1982 or whatever. Um, but yeah, see, so she had to sort of she had to kind of balance out earning enough money to live and, uh, you know, doing what's best for the baby. And then at the end, you know, it all went a bit tits up anyway. Question three, Crowthorn. Tell us about a story with a harmful friendship. Leaving Dirty Jersey by James Salem. Uh, and it's a, a non-fiction memoir about crystal meth. So, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. Not much sleep happening. Uh, his friends, his friends, um, weren't very 
weren't very good to him really. I mean, he was a meth addict, so everybody was just after him for money, drugs, like getting him involved in all these crimes and stuff. Uh, I haven't reread it actually for at least like five years now, and I'd be interested to see if I'd still like it because it is sort of a middle class white guy complaining about his meth addiction. Um, and I'm sure there are kind of more important stories out there, but at the same time, it is fascinating just to read about his crazy life as a meth addict, getting involved in like armed robberies and stuff. He used to live in a house where they had like blackout things over all the windows because they didn't want to know about natural lighting and stuff. It was, uh, it was a harrowing read, a harrowing read, but it's, uh, it's good, especially if you enjoy it with some crystal meth. Question four, screen eight. Tell us about a movie that scares you and that's based on a true story. So we're doing this one here because we have this cinematic landscape behind us. I can see my house from here. My answer for this question, uh, oh, it's really quite dark actually. So. So I'm going to go for Bowling for Columbine. I mean, it's a documentary film, obviously based on a true story. Michael Moore investigating the aftermath of the Columbine school shootings. What I do know is that a shit ton of school shootings have happened since that movie came out. Uh, it seems as though we're not really making any steps as a society to stop that from happening. And it's not just school shootings, it's mass shootings in general. Um, I mean. We don't really have that. We're in the UK, so we just get knife crime, which is a lot less glamorous. But I don't know, we live in a world where people are afraid to go outside in case they get shot in a random mass shooting, you know? And that's just probably the scariest thing of all of the things we've talked about in this video. Question five, the Mount of Death. Beer me, tell us a story where a drink plays a role in the plot. The Last Call at the Nightshade Lounge by Paul Kruger, which is a good name for a horror tag. Uh, it's who is it by? It was by Quirk Publishing, who are very quirky, as this video apparently is. Yeah, it's about this guy who's like, he works in a cocktail bar, and it's got this magic system where, I'm not gonna drink any of this by the way, I'm just holding it for a prop, I'm doing Sober October. Yeah, so he works uh, He works in this, in this uh, nightclub, and he's a mixologist, he prepares these drinks. Um, but the drinks are essentially like magic potions, so the different mixes do different things. So one of them will turn you invisible, and one of them will enable you to detect where monsters are, and one of them will slow time. So Last Call at the Nightshade Lounge by Paul Kruger. It's good. Question six, The Blocked Cellar. Tell us about your favorite horror, paranormal, or true crime YouTube channel. So I'm going to go for that chapter, which is a, uh, uh, an Irish YouTuber, he does true crime. He does a lot of digging into like the backstories of different cases. Um, for me it's like the equivalent of watching something like Forensic Files, except he's got like 600 videos so you can just binge on him. He's also got a great sense of humour, uh, he does a lot of stuff where he talks to like the families and stuff and gets, uh, you know, like police tapes and all this stuff. It's mad what you can get with freedom of information requests, man. He's uh, very entertaining really fascinating cases and uh, like some of them are big name cases that you might have heard of like he did one on the shooting of uh, Jill Dando which is like a big case here in the UK uh, a lot of older cases and equally again a lot of them are still breaking new stuff so some of the recent ones that I've seen he'll do a video on a case and then 10 months later he'll do a, an update video saying so and so's been arrested here's the new evidence here's what you need to know so that chapter on YouTube question seven the night watchman Tell us about a story that's set partly at night. We're in the woods. My answer for this is uh, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, more specifically, I guess, The Fellowship of the Ring. Well, we can't be more specific because there's also The Two Towers. There are a few scenes in Lord of the Rings that take place in, in the dark. Uh, one of the more obvious ones to me is when uh, Frodo gets stabbed by uh, the Nazgul, the, uh, the old kings of the old men the nine and uh, he gets that horrible stab wound that uh, kind of haunts him for the rest of his days really. Um, so there's that iconic scene but there is also the Battle of Helm's Deep which takes place at night and then as we all know Gandalf the White I guess by that point shows up on uh, Shadowfax at the, uh, at, what is it, the, the dawn of, look east on the dawn of the third day. I think, that, I think he said something like that. So we're going Lord of the Rings. Question eight, alone among the gum trees. Tell us about a story that takes place in the wilderness. So uh, this for me is 
It's going to be Shadows on the Tundra and I want to say her name is Dahlia Grinka Viswete. She's Lithuanian or she was Lithuanian and um, her story takes place in the frozen tundras of Russia. Basically um, during the Second World War um, as well as you know all the atrocities that the Nazi party were committing in concentration camps and political prisoner camps. Um, the Soviet Union was doing a lot of messed up janky shit as well. So her and her family were all deported to Siberia and basically put to work in these labour camps and they were just in these horrible conditions where there'd be you know, dozens, hundreds of people all screwed up together in the same room. Um, when people died quite often they didn't have the facilities to like, take them out. Even when they did, uh, during the winter the, the ground was so frozen with permafrost that they couldn't dig graves so they had to wait for the spring and summer to be able to bury people. And it was pretty much a case of people being uh, worked to death and given you know, little to no food, no medical attention in one of the most, uh, one of the harshest, most inhospitable places on the planet. But also what's interesting about this is the story behind the story. So basically the manuscript was written, um, I'm not sure how long after, but after um, she kind of made it back to um, Lithuania. But she buried the manuscript in a jar in her back garden because she was worried uh, that the Soviet uh, authorities would find out about it and that, you know, it cause some more trouble for herself so um, it wasn't actually discovered until after she died and uh, was subsequently printed and is now available it's by Perrin Press so um, yeah definitely read it it's uh, really kind of harrowing non-fiction that tells a story that I don't think is covered enough. Question 9 Highway to Hell tell us about a story that involves music so I'm going for Monsters of Rock which is my well it's not my current work in progress it's a uh, first draft I've completed Hasn't been through editing yet, so you'll probably see it in like five years, knowing my, you know, time to publication. Monsters of Rock is a fiction novel that's uh, Lord of the Rings meets Spinal Tap. So you've got this band that's knocking around, they're playing a bunch of songs. Everybody thinks they're great, but they think they're a bit like Slipknot, where they just wear these weird masks, but they're normal people. Only it turns out uh, that they are actual monsters. Uh, the band is called Real Monsters as well, so you'd think people would pick that up, but no, they just don't don't get it. Uh, so you've got the characters. Oh, they've got some great names as well. <laughs> this is where this is where you're going to start laughing, I think. Okay, so the members of the Monsters of Rock. Well, obviously we have founding member, uh, guitarist, rhythm guitarist, and vocalist and songwriter Groin Gonadson. Here's a dwarf. Uh, what was his? Oh, his. His girlfriend is called Minge Crotched off here, that's the one. So you've got Groin, you've got Yeva Bankowska, she is a uh, wood elf from Latvia, she plays the keyboards and drives a van that's basically the mystery machine from Scooby-Doo. We have the troll, he's called, uh, oh I can't say it, it's called Kurt, Kr it's spelled K-R-Z-T, it's called Kurzt, Kurzt, Kurz, uh, which means rock, 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 which is a good name for a rock musician. Uh, he wanted to play the drums, but he's a troll, so he just hits them too hard and smashes them all to shit. So um, now he plays double bass. He plays like a double bass, but he picks it up and plays it like a normal bass guitar. You've got Vlad Black, who is said to be related to Vlad the Impaler. He's the uh, vampire. He used to play for Spinal Tap and used to spontaneously combust in their outdoor shows because of the sunlight. And yeah, it's basically a good old, you know, band Tory novel where we see what happens on the road. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Uh, Monsters of Rock. Question 10. At the end of the rope, tag some booktube and or horror tube friends. This is a bit I've been looking forward to, but I need some uh, some help from my old friend, uh, Mr. Skeleton here. Uh, artwork by Cameron Rubik, by the way, very talented author as well. So I'm gonna tag all of the authors who took part in this. Uh, all channels are linked below as well. So um, these are all alphabetical by surname. It's always a good thing. So we've got Kevin David Anderson, Cameron Chaney from Library Macabre. We have Dane Cobain from Dane Reads, except I've already done it. James Flynn from Artist James Flynn. We have Mihalis Giorgio Stathis from The Nihilist Geek. Nicholas Gray from Spooky Noodles, great channel. E.D. Lewis from E.D. Lewis Reviews. Andrew Lyle from Grumpy Andrew's Horror House. Marie McWilliams from Marie McWilliams. Lydia Peaver of Typical Books. Ken Poirier from the King for Mayor. <laughs> uh, R. St. Clair from Regina's Haunted Library, that's Regina, who, uh, Regina, sorry, I always say it like Regina, my bad, sorry Regina, uh, who did all the hard work on this. Next, we have Ryan Stroud from Coach Stroud's What to Read While Quarantined. We have Michael Taylor from It's Mikey's Mind, another great channel, love uh, Mikey's videos. D.L. Tillery from Author D.L. Tillery. 
We have Matt Wall from Paperback Junkie, a fellow Bukowski fam. Jason White from Jason's Weird Reads. We have Cam Wolf from Page Nomad, big up Cam. And we have CJ Wright from CJ Wright's Book and Horror. So there we go, you guys all tagged. So anyway, that was the Local Haunts book tag. I'll leave all the information below where you can find out more about the Local Haunts anthology and all of the authors in it, who are also all of the people I've tagged. But if you want to take the tag, feel free. Again, all the information down below, take the questions, run with it, do some spooky shit. It'll be great. So in the meantime, let me know in the comments if you're going to be reading Local Haunts. And if you have, let me know what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Spooky day now.